So let's get started. I think that um, folks will be entering, uh, and we want we have a really exciting uh, session today. I want to welcome everyone to the World Health Organization a Global Brain Health Clinical Exchange Platform. Uh, my name is Dr. Kieran Thacker, and I'm a neurologist at Columbia University in New York City, where I do inpatient neurology, and I also do uh, neuroinfectious diseases. Um, as folks are entering, please enter your information in the chat. We're so excited. And I'm joined by um, a close colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Binyam Ayeli, who's also co-chairing. He's an assistant professor of neurology and consultant neurologist at, at Addis Ababa University. And um, I'm so excited to have him here as well. So today I'm really so excited to introduce Dr. Aaron Berkowitz. Um, he's a close colleague and uh, amazing global health neurologist. He's a professor and director of global health at Kaiser Permanente uh, School of Medicine and a senior specialist consultant in neurologist at the Medicine Sans Frontier. And he's done a lot of global health work specifically in Haiti um, with Partners of Health and also uh, an acclaimed author and has written an amazing book, One by One by One, which I urge all of you to read. Today, he's going to speak to us and um, teach us about decision analysis to address clinical dilemmas in resource limited settings. And uh, we're really excited to have you, Dr. Berkowitz, and looking forward to the talk and all the questions and interactions during the breakout sessions. Great, well, thank you so much, um, Kieran and Greta and Ben. Let me get my slides up here for inviting uh, me to the, uh, the Global Health Network Brain Health Clinical Exchange. I'm pleased to be with you here uh, this morning for me, afternoon and evening probably for um, many of you. And um, so as uh, Kieran mentioned, uh, I'd like to talk this morning about the use of decision analysis uh, to think through clinical dilemmas. And um, I'll be walking you through a case study where I found this uh, quite useful in my practice and resource limited settings related to stroke uh, with the hope of really sort of showing you um, behind the curtain, under the hood, you know, how these uh, types of decision analyses are um, set up and um, designed in a relatively straightforward way so that um, in the discussion, you can think through um, whether this technique um, may be helpful to you in, in thinking through either individual patient level clinical dilemmas or some um, larger uh, systemic uh, clinical uh, dilemmas. And look forward to discussing this with you in uh, the breakout rooms and subsequent discussion. So um, let's begin with a case to set the stage. Um, we'll take the case of a 69 year old woman with a history of hypertension presenting to a health center in rural Haiti two days after sudden development of right-sided paralysis and difficulty speaking. A diagnosis of stroke is made. There's no CT scan available to determine if the stroke is ischemic or hemorrhagic. So in addition to acute stabilization, evaluating for etiology, consideration of risk factor modification and rehabilitation, a uh, question that often comes up is, would you initiate aspirin for a long-term secondary stroke prevention in this patient, acknowledging again that without CT available, it would be impossible to know if the stroke is ischemic or hemorrhagic. So we'll actually put this um, to the audience in a survey, and uh, our colleagues here will help us uh, get the survey up um, uh, to ask you this question. If you were seeing this patient in a rural, uh, low resource setting, had no CT, and saw a patient with a stroke, uh, would you uh, treat uh, this patient or other such patients with aspirin, or uh, would you withhold uh, uh, aspirin uh, in this clinical scenario. So we'll take it to the survey and see um, what people think. So um, turns out in the field, the number is actually uh, much lower. So this is from the PURE study about 10 years ago, looking at uh, secondary prevention uh, after cardiovascular events. And this table from that paper, particularly focused on stroke, showed that in low income countries, just about 4% uh, of patients are on aspirin after a stroke. Now, aspirin is cheap, it's widely available, it's a highly uh, uh, effective secondary prevention agent, reducing the risk of a second stroke after a first ischemic stroke um, by about 20%. So why is this um, number so low? Well, my experience um, in the field was similar to um, the 37% uh, of you uh, who said uh, they would rather withhold aspirin and that clinicians who pose this question to me often uh, said that, um, you know, out of the concern that the patient could have a hemorrhagic stroke, they prefer to withhold a potentially harmful um, treatment um, in the sort of vein of, of, of do no harm. And um, 
On the other hand, however, that means that patients with ischemic stroke are deprived of a very effective uh, secondary prevention agent. So what's sort of the right answer here? Well, as I looked into this question, I realized that this is probably the situation that most stroke patients and their providers face uh, throughout the world, because according to the WHO Global Atlas of Medical Devices, while there are about 42 CT scanners per 1 million population in uh, high-income countries, that number falls by a factor of greater than 100 in low-income countries, such that there are just about three CT scanners per 10 million population. And as those of you who work in or have worked in low resource settings know that many times the CT scanners are not necessarily operational or don't have a tech available 24 hours a day or the patient can't afford uh, to get to the place where the CT scanner is or if they can get there to afford um, the scan. So what this means is that although the American Heart and American Stroke Association and other uh, uh, national and, and uh, global organizations have guidelines for the management of ischemic stroke and a separate set of guidelines for the management of intracerebral hemorrhage, Without CT to determine which guidelines to open, uh, most of the world's patients with stroke are, are, are probably not able uh, to be managed according to these um, guidelines. So um, early on in my um, work in Haiti, this question kept coming up again and again, uh, later in Malawi as well, and I wanted to try to figure out some type of answer uh, from my colleagues. So I, uh, the first time this was posed to me was when I was working in uh, Haiti as a resident. And I came back and asked one of my stroke and ICU attendings, um, brilliant, um, neurologist, Dr. Sherry Cho, who's now at uh, Northwestern University in Chicago in the United States. And I said, well, here's sort of my intuition around this. Um, if you think about it, the majority of strokes are ischemic, the minority are hemorrhagic. And so if we take a population-based approach, and we know that aspirin is a highly effective secondary prevention agent, um, wouldn't we just give aspirin to everyone, uh, in that case, uh, giving the benefit to the majority, and some small risk of unclear uh, uh, amount uh, to, the, to the minority of patients who have an intracerebral hemorrhage. And the truth of the matter is that intracerebral hemorrhage, even in a high resource setting, has a mortality of about 30% at one month, probably much higher in low resource settings. Morbid side of the argument is the aspirin really what's um, tipping people over. And she said, well, I agree with your logic and intuition, but that's um, not good enough, right? We should be scientific. Why don't you head across town? This is when I was still in Boston to the Mass General Hospital where um, Brandon Westover and Matt Bianchi, two um, neurologists expert in decision analysis, can help you think through this a little more rigorously. Um, so that's what we did in a paper published here that we can share um, with the group. And so I'd like to walk you through the decision analysis here, both to show you what we found, but also, as I mentioned earlier, really to show you the mechanics of how this works, um, uh, to hopefully encourage you to think of this as not just a powerful tool to think about how to simulate or model a clinical trial that is unlikely to ever be performed. But I have found that um, working on decision analysis has also influenced my individual patient clinical decision making. Because as uh, all of you know, in neurology, oftentimes we're reliant on some balance of uh, science and intuition. And this helped me at least sort of quantify um, why I was um, developing my intuition to some extent. So um, making, uh, creating a decision analysis essentially has four uh, basic elements. The first element is a decision tree. And so what this is is sort of a branch diagram of all the potential outcomes you could imagine having to uh, a patient uh, that could occur to a patient in a simulated clinical trial. Um, so for example, here our clinical trial is gonna be taking patients with stroke and either treating them with aspirin or not. And again, this will be a computer model, a simulation. I, emphasize that because when we submitted this paper for review, we were asked why we didn't have IRB approval and had to um, uh, tell the editors that no ones and zeros were harmed in the making of this uh, simulation. So um, this here would be sort of our table one, right, in our uh, clinical trial, very pared down, but what are the demographics of the population enrolled in this simulated trial? In this case, we're looking at patients who've either had an ischemic stroke or an intracerebral hemorrhage, acknowledging that we don't know which one it is, and we'll talk about how the model addresses that uncertainty in a moment. Um, so these are all the outcomes now branching out that you would see in your table two and three, the outcomes you're trying to prevent um, and any adverse uh, uh, events as well. So from this initial ischemic stroke that caused the patient to come into this uh, simulated trial, the patient could survive or die. In the subsequent uh, time period that's being measured, they could have a recurrent ischemic stroke, again, from which they could survive or die. They could have an intracerebral hemorrhage from which they could survive or die, or they could make it through another year or whatever the selected time period is with no further uh, clinical events. 
Similarly, on the hemorrhage side, there's the possibility of a recurrent hemorrhage. There's a possibility of an ischemic stroke. There's the possibility of surviving or not. And of course, all of these are modified to some extent by the use of aspirin. Aspirin either decreasing the risk of a recurrent ischemic stroke or increasing the risk of an intracerebral hemorrhage. So each of these nodes here uh, in the decision analysis uh, framework um, gets a probability. And those probabilities um, come from the literature and can be assessed uh, in the model as such. So um, I used a software package called TreeAge, a play on the word triage, but with the word uh, tree at the front of it, there are others. And essentially it's just like this, very user-friendly. You don't have to know how to program or anything. I don't know any of that stuff. I don't uh, fully understand the complexities of the math behind it, just the basic um, gist that I'm conveying here. Um, but essentially you just draw this out uh, in this uh, user-friendly interface. I don't work for them, but I have a couple of interest just telling you that it's a very easy um, software to use. And then you plug in your um, transition probabilities. So those probabilities are called inputs and those come from the literature. In the case of stroke, we had a large uh, literature to draw from. So I mentioned earlier that aspirin decreases the risk of a second stroke after an initial ischemic stroke by about 20%. And that data comes from the antiplatelet trialist collaboration meta-analysis, which is the data that we're citing when we say we should be giving patients after an ischemic stroke aspirin because it will reduce their risk of a second stroke at the small at the expense of a small increase in the risk of intracerebral hemorrhage. Now you might ask, well, has anyone done a trial of giving aspirin to patients with hemorrhage? And if they had, you wouldn't have had to do this analysis in the first place. Um, oops, sorry, some of my slides moved here. Um, so. Um, essentially what we're looking at here for the um, rates of events after a patient uh, has had hemorrhage and has started on aspirin are from uh, less reliable data sources um, because they are retrospective reviews of patients who had coronary artery disease or what have you, had an intracerebral hemorrhage and their providers thought it was best to keep them on aspirin. But indeed, being on aspirin did decrease their risk of an ischemic uh, stroke um, at the expense of a small increased risk in hemorrhage. I won't go through all of these numbers, but you get the idea that you would pull numbers from the literature where they're available, and if not, use estimates and plug them in at each of these nodes as far as the probabilities. Once you have all of your numbers in, the first type of analysis uh, or one type of analysis you can run is called a base case analysis, which essentially looks at what the model will predict um, at the end of one time point with all of the data sort of frozen as such. And you'll see what I mean by kind of frozen in a moment when I talk about sensitivity analysis. So for example, we say that um, we're looking at the case uh, of a 69 year old individual, that's the average age at stroke onset in low and middle income countries. And if you remember, I said, we have to decide what proportion of these patients have had, had their strokes that are due to hemorrhage rather than ischemic stroke. The number we chose here is 34%. That comes from uh, the interstroke study, which showed that in Sub-Saharan Africa and other lower income regions, the percent of strokes or the proportion of strokes that are due to intracerebral hemorrhage is actually much higher than that in high income countries. Unclear why this is, whether there's some type of referral bias that patients with hemorrhage are sicker and therefore end up or are more likely to end up in um, facilities, tertiary facilities where they can get a CT scan um, or whether that is um, an effect of hypertension being the dominant risk factor uh, for both, um, but perhaps some of the other risk factors, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, smoking, perhaps being less prevalent in some of the poorest regions, but unknown uh, why this is the case. So we plug all those numbers in and run our base case analysis. And so this is a table showing the predicted one-year outcomes per 1,000 uh, patients according to the model. So we'd see a very slight decrease in mortality from just above 103 per 1,000 to just below, not particularly impressive. With respect to ischemic strokes, we'd actually see a decrease in about 11 per 1,000 at the expense of just under um, four per 1,000 uh, increase in intracerebral hemorrhage or a net decrease in about seven strokes per 1,000 patients. This may not sound particularly impressive, but if you consider according to global burden of disease data that there were about 12 million strokes in low and middle income countries in a given year, um, if you gave aspirin to all of those patients, uh, the model would predict that you decrease the number of recurrent strokes by about 85,000 per year and decrease the number of stroke related mortalities by about 4,000 per year. Now, the beauty of decision analysis is um, it allows you to use what's called sensitivity analysis to sort of play with the parameters here and see to what extent the predictions the model makes will hold up. So let me show you some uh, examples of this. So I mentioned that I uh, use the, the, or we use the percentage here of strokes due to hemorrhage being uh, 
And let's say you told me you work in a region of the world where you've collected data that actually the proportion of strokes due to hemorrhage is 60%. Do the predictions of the model still hold? Well, you can run the model out um, over these parameters. This is called decision, uh, the sensitivity analysis and see whether the curves cross. On the y-axis here, we have a measure called quality or quality adjusted life years. These are pulled from tables in the literature. Don't have uh, time to get into those today, but essentially a, a measure of uh, estimate of quality of life. Unfortunately, this technique doesn't allow us to use error bars and you see these curves are quite close to each other, but at the very least it shows that even to the highest uh, proportion one could imagine of stroke being due to hemorrhage or beyond <laughs> what one would imagine, right? That the curves don't cross and the idea that um, about 30 to 40% of uh, those surveyed today held and that many colleagues in the field held that we shouldn't give aspirin to anyone, we could be harming them. This sort of refutes that idea and suggests that withholding aspirin could actually be um, more harmful. Now, most people will say, well, I would feel most uncomfortable giving aspirin to a patient who could have an intracerebral hemorrhage. And you said you pulled that data from retrospective analyses. The base case uh, here was a relative risk of about 1.7, but a very wide confidence interval around that since this is a uh, retrospective uh, review. So let's run a sensitivity analysis across and beyond that 95% confidence interval. Well, in this case, you see the curves do cross, but they cross beyond that 95% confidence interval. So aspirin would have to increase the risk of a recurrent hemorrhage threefold or 300%, which is beyond what's sort of clinically plausible according to the literature. So again, these uh, data suggest that um, the strategy of giving aspirin uh, to all patients uh, with stroke when it's unclear whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic um, is potentially favorable uh, as opposed to the strategy of not giving aspirin um, to anyone. Now, of course, uh, we're overemphasizing aspirin today um, because we're talking about decision analysis as a concept, um, but um, this is one small part of uh, stroke care. Uh, we were actually interestingly vindicated um, several years later and several years ago when someone actually did do a trial of aspirin for uh, uh, restarting aspirin in patients with intracerebral hemorrhage and showed that it's probably um, not as harmful as perceived. Um, if you're interested in uh, how we might situate this in protocols and resource limited settings amongst the entire package of interventions that are helpful um, for uh, care of patients with stroke, uh, hot off the press last week, uh, working with some of my colleagues in the US as well as in Zambia, Ghana, and Nepal, uh, we developed um, some guidance here that uh, came out in stroke uh, last week. So I'll stop here on that uh, whirlwind tour of decision analysis and uh, take questions and then uh, look forward to the discussion. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Uh, Ayeli for um, hosting some of the questions. That was a great, great talk. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Aaron. This is a great, I think, way of analyzing available data in order to help our patient and of uh, a better out clinical outcome, especially in resource community settings. So uh, we'll try to <clears throat> get questions from uh, the participants. Um, you can post uh, your questions in the chat box or you can unmute yourself and maybe ask questions regarding what Dr. Aaron has presented or if you have any challenge in, this, in your setting. Uh, maybe in the meantime, uh, I can discuss, maybe mention a few points <clears throat> that uh, this kind of approach would be helpful in, uh, I think, solving and subsequently having good management of patients. Uh, I think we, we do have some questions in the chat box, or maybe you can address that. Yeah, I can read it for you. Um... So uh, does headache help determining ischemia, ischemia as opposed to hemorrhage? And then how is this used potentially in, in modeling aspirin use? So some of the clinical features, how is that helpful? Yeah, great, great question. Um, when I was first looking into this question, I hope that we could figure out uh, a way to um, figure this out at the bedside, right? Um, because uh, presence of headache, very high diastolic blood pressure presentation, nausea, vomiting, depressed level of consciousness are all um, relatively more predictive of intracerebral hemorrhage, but of course, none of them are perfect alone um, or in combination. There's something called the Siri Raj score, which tries to put some of these together 
to make a clinical predictor of whether the patient has an ischemic stroke or an intracerebral hemorrhage. But there's one of these very nice um, JAMA rational clinical exam series articles, is my patient having an ischemic or hemorrhagic stroke that essentially shows that um, none of these predictors, either alone or in combination, are um, particularly um, sensitive or specific. So again, I've sort of talked about decision analysis here and crafting a um, population-based approach, but um, when providers ask me, well, what should I actually do? I say, well, look, if you think the patient's having an ischemic stroke and your only reluctance is, well, just in case it could be um, hemorrhage, I'm not gonna withhold aspirin. I think our data suggests if you're clinically convinced it's an ischemic stroke, then there's no reason not to give aspirin. If you're clinically convinced it's an intracerebral hemorrhage, the patient has a depressed level of consciousness or headache out of proportion to their deficits, um, fine to withhold um, aspirin in those cases. And if you're not sure, it's either probably an ischemic stroke or a very small hemorrhage. In that case, the risk of giving aspirin is, um, is relatively low. The other thing to think about here is um, timing. Uh, this is a um, the decision analysis. I didn't show all the different elements of it, but this is for looking at long-term secondary prevention. Question often comes up what to do in the acute uh, setting where we know aspirin has its own benefits secondary to the IST and CAST. Um, data in the acute setting within the first 48 hours um, uh, with improved outcomes at two to four weeks at discharge. Um, and the, the truth of the matter is in most resource limited settings, at least in my experience and that of colleagues um, with whom I've discussed this, that patients are often not presenting in the first 24 hours anyway due to um, access uh, to care. And the highest risk of hemorrhage expansion is within the 24, uh, first 24 hours. So we did do a separate decision analysis and model this that suggests that probably between hours 25 and um, 48 uh, to get the benefit of IST cast and without the risk to potential um, hemorrhages is reasonable, but we've, uh, we've published a separate uh, study looking at that data as well. Maybe Dr. Aaron, uh, if you can comment on one of the patients from Dr. Ilani from Malawi. Uh, yeah. She said, often use uh, C Siri Raj score to estimate the likelihood of stroke, whether it's being ischemia or hemorrhage, how sensitive and how accurate this clinical. Yeah, it would be great if, um, if Dr. Melanie would like to, to unmute and tell us a little bit about how you, um, how you use that score. My understanding is that it's, um, it's, it's helpful to us as clinicians, but when it's been evaluated, the sensitivity and specificity are uh, relatively imprecise. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but. Is this something you use in a protocol in uh, Malawi? Um, and um, how effective have you have you found it? Acknowledging that it may be hard to to prove in some instances. Um, I think you have an MRI at Queen Elizabeth, but not a CT scanner, if I recall. But not too many MRIs um, per month. Uh, no obligation, but if you'd like to unmute and tell us a yeah. little bit about, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so. We use it clinically, but it hasn't been evaluated or validated in our setting, and no one has looked at the outcomes of, um, you know, using the score. Um, the MRI is down for a long time now, and I think CT scan is only reserved for patients where we think um, it's going to make a difference in the acute management of the patient. Um, so most patients will still be started on aspirin um, or, or the aspirin will be withheld based on the serialized score. But, but my question is for, for those patients that we withhold the aspirin or based on the serialized score, how long should, should we wait before we can start the aspirin for secondary prevention? Yeah, great, great question. So um, as I mentioned, we have a separate study. I didn't have time to go through it. Um, today, looking at the acute setting that suggests that even in the acute setting, if you look at IST and CAST, actually, there's a, a table in there that um, because patients were randomized before CT based on clinical evaluation, they actually randomized 700 patients who ended up having intracerebral hemorrhage. And the punchline is that they did fine. And so we were able to use that um, um, data there. So that being said, if you're concerned or not sure that violates your hospital um, protocol, we generally um, would say after the first 24 hours, uh, it's, it's probably fine. And if you really wanna be um, careful after the first 48 hours, because we are even starting DVT prophylaxis in that um, setting, which is probably a more powerful antithrombotic than, than aspirin and, um, and that, that has been studied and shown to be safe. Thanks so much. Thanks Melanie right. for sharing Thank you, your Melanie. thoughts. It's really, really helpful to hear
hear everybody's um, experiences. Um, I think we have uh, Dr. Viraj who has his hand up and then we're gonna, we wanna hear from everybody. We'll have some time at the end um, for more questions. There's a lot coming in, Aaron. So you, this is a hot topic. <laughs> um, Dr. Viraj, do you wanna um, uh, yeah. give us your question? Sure, thank you, Dr. Becker. It's uh, very interesting. Um, to, to step back from uh, aspirin and stroke specifically, but to think about the decision analysis stuff, um, that software is clearly very interesting and can be applied to almost any clinical question that you can care to pose. Um, and, and you've obviously chosen a situation here with quite a lot of uh, data. Uh, so aspirin and, and stroke is, is great because there's so much data you can use and literature to plug into those nodes. Um, obviously, in neurology, in any setting, there's lots of situations where there isn't an awful lot of data. How does that software fill in the gaps if we don't have particular data to put into those nodes? Yeah, great, um, great question. So um, uh, the software doesn't fill in the gaps. You would have to um, uh, okay. fill in fill in the gaps. It's it's helpful, but unfortunately not um, uh, not that helpful. So essentially, this is another use of sensitivity analysis. So I sort of showed the example of where we had data that was um, had wide confidence intervals and was from retrospective studies rather than um, trials. If you look at the decision analysis um, literature, there are some situations where there, there just aren't um, any data. And so people put in an estimate. You can um, base that estimate on some combination of uh, intuition and science. And then the key is running the sensitivity analysis, right? So you have to put something in so the model doesn't have hole, a hole in it or holes in it but you can run sensitivity analysis on each parameter. And I didn't show it here to not get into the complexity, but you can run two-way sensitivity analysis, three-way sensitivity analysis, and get these sort of um, curves showing where one, two, three, as many curves as you want, where they do or don't cross and what's under them and what's above them. And so, um, for example, um, we had here, part of um, what gives you the result is the quality adjusted life year um, measure. And that's comes from most people, the ones for stroke, if you, dig, um, they all come from one study where patients were sort of surveyed using kind of this behavioral economics discounting analysis. How much, how many years would you want to live with condition X? How many years would you want to live? And then they just generate a number. Well, that doesn't <laughs> inspire great confidence, right? Um, but you can run sensitivity analysis on every parameter and it's relatively standard to then report out, look across these parameters um, that, that seem reasonable, the model holds up. Or, you know, again, this is a model and we're doing something theoretical, it's fine to theorize and say, beyond this point, the model does break down, suggesting that in clinical scenario X, you know, we wouldn't want to consider mm -hmm. this. There's a classic one to look at of, that's frequently uh, mentioned of um, anticoagulation and fall risk in older adults. How many times would someone have to fall to lose the benefit of anticoagulation for atrial fibrillation? Um, and so if you look at that one, you'll see that there are many places where um, you know, it has to be estimated how many times that a person falls, would they have an intracranial hemorrhage and how many times would it be severe, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so you just make your best guess and then run sens sensitivity analysis to see over what range um, your, your guess is valid and where it breaks down. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. That's a, that was a great question and answer for our segue to our breakout session. So the question I would uh, pose to you to consider is what are some clinical dilemmas you've seen uh, in your clinical practice or on a broader sort of epidemiologic level where you'd love to see a clinical trial, but one has never been performed is maybe unlikely to be performed. And um, how would you start thinking about how to model um, this out? Where would you be able to easily find data to plug in? Where um, to Viraj's question, would you have to invent it? And how would you think about um, inventing it? And um, it's discussions like this that have led to a um, number of um, uh, papers. So this is interesting and exciting to you. It's um, something I've enjoyed uh, thinking about and maybe some, uh, some papers will come out of uh, today's discussions. Hi, everybody. I think uh, we're all coming back into the main room. We had a really um, fruitful discussion in my group, I have to say. It was, uh, it was interesting and lively. So. Um, Thanks again to Dr. Berkowitz. I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Ayeli again, maybe to start us off. And there's lots, of, I don't know, we're, we have 10 minutes, but we'll give you what we can. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kiran. So Dr. Aron was in my group, and we had a great discussion and point that have been raised. I'll try to summarize those points and uh, how to utilize these uh, decision analysis tool in 
not only in stroke management as well as in the aspirin usage, but rather in a wide spectrum of uh, stroke uh, service, including post-stroke as well as even TPAs and things like that, in, in order to influence the policymakers, that's one point, and in Dr. Aron has responded, and maybe uh, I can list all these points, or uh, we can discuss these points as a group. How you want me to continue? Maybe we can maybe we can just hear an overview from everybody, and then um, as time permits, we can we'll hand it over to um, Dr. Berkowitz. So, okay, perfect. So, the second question is uh, from Christina. If <clears throat> we need to be careful in this kind of scenario, whenever we come up with something that can substitute a standard of care, um, even though for now it's usable that people can use such kind of decision analysis to help to define and to guide their management while not ignoring the standard of care. And always we need to opt for uh, to, uh, to work on availability of CT scan imaging and appropriate way of management needs to be uh, entertained, I think. But globally in the area where this Imagings are not available. Currently, I think this is the best thing a clinician can utilize in order to help his patients. Uh, another point from Dr. Gupta is also, um, even in the area where CT scans are available, it's also good to utilize this imaging appropriately, not to order for right and left for all patients. If we can clinically able to confirm that this is ischemic stroke, sometimes good to also rely on clinically and then manage patient accordingly. Uh, I think these are the points, maybe if uh, there are points I missed, Dr. Aaron can. <laughs> great, great, good. And we'll, um, we'll have time to comment. Um, Dr. Wood, would you like to um, speak about the, the discussions in your group? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and th thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm Greta Wood. I'm based in the University of Liverpool, uh, looking normally at neurological infectious diseases. Uh, and actually, in our group, we were talking about febrile encephalopathy and whether there were situations where you might, based on clinical features, want to give empiric steroids, even waiting for um, you know results from lumbar puncture, or if you didn't have the laboratory facilities to know the, the etiology. And we were saying, were there a set of clinical features where you'd say actually giving steroids, wondering whether there's an underlying kind of immune mediated process would outweigh any harm of giving you know steroids if there was an underlying infectious uh, etiology. And we were saying it would, that would probably be based on like a number of features, but if we could think of just a handful, it would probably be the the background etiologies in that setting. So actually what proportion are infectious, what proportion do we think are immune mediated? And then within that, what infections are prevalent, you know, and are there infections where steroids might benefit or might harm? Um, and then the clinical features in the individual patient. So you might be more likely to think of an autoimmune etiology if it was perhaps a subacute onset, though of course we know there are some infectious etiologies that can present subacutely, um, but also if there was a lack of fever, perhaps if there were a prominent movement disorder or prominent psychiatric features, but that you could perhaps look in the literature and get those features in different um, clinical settings uh, and then, uh, yes, uh, go from there. Thank you. Great. Did you want to comment, um, Dr. Berkowitz, on, on any of that? Or that was, yeah, that's really important um, in terms of kind of that idea of focusing on febrile encephalopathy. Yeah, I think um, there are a lot of infectious disease decision analyses one can think of. And I think um, I, there were some of these we considered trying to work on. And the challenge was um, data, right? Um, to try to figure out, as we said, we as um, Viraj had, had asked, right, there is certainly room in this uh, technique to say, we don't have data here, we're going to just make a rough estimate. But if everything in the model is a rough estimate, then well, that, um, we sort of get into a vicious cycle, right? If this is why we needed the model, but also we have nothing <laughs> um, to put into it. So it sometimes um, helps in those situations to codify a more discrete um, case that's a, a little less broad modeled out. So maybe just the presentation of meningitis, right? Or just the presentation of encephalitis so that you can sort of narrow the playing field a little bit 
Um, instead of saying it could be any uh, fever and altered mental status, you know, we could be anywhere from right, bacterial meningitis to endocarditis to uh, urinary tract infection with secondary um, delirium, right? So um, to say what, what could be a sort of base case, if you will, of um, uh, um, one scenario, and then you could even consider um, several models um, based on that. But when we started, you know, we were talking about sort of stroke in general, we wanted to, to account for blood pressure and all these things and realize let's sort of zoom in on one um, question here. And once you sort of, you know, bitten off that piece and gotten a clear answer, um, sometimes that helps you move along to the next, um, next question. And also um, it be, allow yourself to have a little bit um, more precise data to work with. Because meningitis, for example, you could say, well, there's a smaller range of uh, there's still a very large range, but a smaller range, perhaps, of pathogens and pathologies causing that than uh, encephalitis. I'm not sure if um, that, that number is right now, but at least a discrete situation where you can say, and which of these would steroids actually be harmful? Which would these be good? Instead of saying, I have a you know 40 by by 40 matrix, I have a now you know 10 by 10 <laughs> matrix of possibilities. But yeah, that's a there's there's many possibilities I think in neuroinfectious disease for sure, um, where these questions come up in in high resource settings as well. Great. Um, I'll be I'll be brief because we just have a couple minutes. But um, we had a great discussion, and we really focused on, okay, well, how can decision analysis be helpful to the clinician on the ground, um, and and had like a general discussion around that, which I think was um, uh, really important to kind of understand that um, we had points of view of well, you know, as a clinician, I kind of naturally do decision analyses in my head. That's what we do, right? Is we kind of weigh risks and benefits of everything, but that comes with some degrees of um, bias, obviously, that we have. And, you know, we may or may not be up on, you know, all the latest kind of caveats or um, uh, kind of up-to-date studies. So that was kind of one um, kind of framework that we had for the overall discussion. And then we talked about um, some of the things that we thought in terms of large buckets that could be really useful for decision analyses. And one was if the pathways for management were very different. So um, Dr. Gia mentioned as a trainee that he's been, you know, struggled with um, the differential of someone coming into the um, ER acutely with an acute stroke versus seizure. And so thinking about how we could use decision analysis to get that pathway so that we could actually do the appropriate management and not kind of go down the wrong um, secondary steps. Um, so when the management is kind of in differential is kind of very separated. Um, and then there was also a large discussion about the importance of using decision analyses um, for training of non-neurologists and non-specialists and potentially using, you know, your tool and how that could be applied for um, folks who are managing neurological conditions but may not know the evidence as well. And then also, you know, there was questions and, and comments by Professor Griffiths around um, how we're going to implement um, this type of decision tree analysis. And we wanted to kind of um, ask you, you know, how, how this has been implemented. Is this an opportunity for folks on this call to kind of work on implementation of something like this and see kind of what the effects are? What are the risks? Like, do we do a kind of assessment of, of does this decision tree analysis work? Yeah, these are some of the same um, themes that came up in, in our group. Um, and um, one of our colleagues from, from Italy um, asked the important question of, you know, you've done all this work around aspirin. If this gets into the hands of policymakers, does this actually have the risk of people being overly focused on aspirin as some type of, you know, panacea for patients with acute stroke and not thinking about all the other important aspects of, of uh, stroke care? So again, uh, um, obviously a brief presentation trying to um, demonstrate a technique, but all that to say, I completely agree the focus on aspirin here is because this is a clinical question that came up in the field. And if you think about the management of ischemic stroke and intracerebral hemorrhage, um, much of the inpatient management and outpatient management is shared, right? Prevention of deep venous thrombosis, prevention of aspiration pneumonia, um, prevention of or treatment of a fever, hyperglycemia, et cetera. Um, there are only a few parameters, namely aspirin and, and blood pressure um, that um, would be quite different um, in both. So um, as far as, you know, making this or considering this as part of um, policies or on a smaller level as part of um, protocols. Important to mention this would be part of a much larger package of many probably more impactful um, in a, uh, interventions um, to, to improve the outcomes of patients with stroke. And this is just one small piece of the puzzle, but one that gives us um, a way to think about an interesting um, technique. So some people ask me in the field, do you, you know, present this to your colleagues, the slides and the sensitivity analyses? 
Um, most of the time this comes up at the bedside and people say, what would you do in this situation? I say, I don't know. I think probably I'm um, aspirin, but I can't say for sure. And now I can say, actually, we looked at this. I can go through it in detail, but the punchline is not giving aspirin to anyone is also harmful, right? And um, this gets into the, the questions of just our, as Kieran said, our sort of biases around decision-making of we don't wanna do something that causes harm, but sometimes not doing something is, is causing harm as well. And to try to get us a little bit out of our biased um, intuitions. And this, your other point, Kieran, I wanted to speak to as well, came up in our um, group. How does this apply at the bedside just as a sort of way of thinking? And um, one of our colleagues um, asked, you know, could this also help our patients understand how we make um, decisions in addition to helping us understand how we make decisions? And I um, agree completely in the sense that, um, as, as you mentioned, Karen, in your group, somebody said that, you know, we're sort of always doing this, but how consciously are we doing this? And so I think for me, what's been important is saying, okay, this is an ambiguous situation and I'm going to make a quote judgment call, whatever that means. But if I was building this out, not that I will necessarily draw it out on the back of a napkin, but to ask myself, where am I certain and where am I uncertain, right? Um, so to, to Greta's point, right, in a patient with fever and confusion, right now I'm very uncertain, right? I don't know the diagnosis, I don't know the pathogen, I don't know sort of um, where I am, but once things start coalescing around a particular syndrome, okay, maybe I'm sure this patient has meningitis and it's fast, and maybe I'm sure even that it's um, bacterial, but where am I unsure? Um, and then that would be the question mark note and where I'm unsure, um, where do my scales sort of balance as far as risk and, and benefit and at least acknowledging to myself and then you can acknowledge to the patient, right? Yeah. Here's an aspect of your care we're not sure about. Yeah, and I, I can tell you what I would do, but I, I wanna explain the uncertainty around it. Great, great. I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Ayeli to say bye. <laughs> Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Really, this is a very useful tool for both clinicians as well as patients, caregivers, and I think thank you to Global Health Initiative, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Aaron, for a wonderful presentation and really, you know, overview of uh, these materials. All the participants and have great discussion. Hopefully, we'll have the same things in the future. <laughs>